And so now we're going to actually, I didn't talk about bacteria. <laughs> That's the only thing I didn't talk about. <laughs> and we're going to move to CRISPR, an anti-CRISPR system, even cooler, right? Uh, with Blake Wiedenheft from Montana State University. Take it away. All right, thank you. Um, good evening, and thanks so much for the opportunity to participate. I was feeling a little bit like I might be an outsider, but Cedric already talked about CRISPRs and talked about evolutionary tinkering, and those are the two concepts that I wanted to talk about today. Um, but the CRISPRs I'm going to talk about are the, actually the CRISPRs in bacteria and how they function in conflict with the virally encoded anti-CRISPRs. And the CRISPR system that I'm going to spend this evening speaking about is captured in this complex here. It's a 350 kilodalton ribonucleoprotein complex. It's a CRISPR RNA-guided foreign DNA surveillance machine. But the part about this machine that I find most interesting is not really this machine itself at all, but rather these virally encoded proteins that are small anti-CRISPRs that have figured out how to wedge themselves into these immune surveillance complexes in a way that completely neutralize them. All right, so um, I think most of you are familiar with CRISPRs, but my job for this evening is to try to teach at least everyone in this room something new about CRISPRs. So I'll do my best to do that. Uh, you all know that these are part of adaptive immune systems that are in bacteria, and that they're found in about 40% of bacterial genomes and about 98% of archaeal genomes. But this is really bizarre to me. They're completely excluded from the eukaryotic domain of life. So we don't understand this distribution at all. But what we do know is that wherever CRISPRs are found, they function as part of an adaptive immune system that occurs in three steps, adaptation, CRISPR RNA biogenesis, and interference. And it's really this first step that I think we still know the least about. In the first step, a piece of foreign DNA is snatched from the incoming viral or plasmid genome and inserted at one end of the CRISPR element in a way that maintains this repeat spacer, repeat architecture. So this new piece, a little fragment DNA that's mobilized is flanked by repetitive elements. Um, this CRISPR is transcribed. And these long pre-CRISPR transcripts are subsequently processed or diced into a library of small CRISPR-derived RNAs. And each one of these small, mature CRISPR RNAs contains a unique sequence that was derived from and is then by definition complementary to this previously encountered foreign invader. And these small RNAs are all bound by a large number of different CRISPR-associated proteins or Cas proteins to form these large ribonucleoprotein complexes that perform a pretty sophisticated job. They have to patrol the entire intracellular environment, find and bind this foreign DNA, and in the case of a lytic virus, it has to mark that foreign DNA for destruction in a matter of minutes because a lot of lytic viruses program the cell for lysis in the first couple of minutes. So that's a pretty remarkable task. So it doesn't actually look for a complementary base pairing. It streamlines the surveillance process by first protein-mediated interactions with a short sequence motif called a PAM, and that ephemeral interaction results in a distortion of the DNA, and that DNA bending then facilitates RNA-guided strand invasion to check for complementarity. <laughs> so if it meets those two criteria, containing a PAM and complementary base pairing, then that marks the sequence for destruction by the CRISPR-guided RNA nuclease. But if these immune systems are so good at destroying invading DNA, then why haven't all the viruses gone extinct? And that might seem a little absurd because viruses are the most diverse and abundant biological agents on the planet. There's an estimated 10 to the 31 virus particles on Earth, and they ca roughly cause about 10 to the 23 infections every second. So one way to escape these RNA-guided surveillance complexes is pretty obvious with replication rates and population sizes of this size. One way is just to have mutations in the PAM sequence or mutations in the protospacer sequence itself. But it turns out there's an alternative, another escape mechanism that's a, maybe more interesting. Um, it's anti-CRISPR proteins. So some of these early genes that are encoded by viruses express small proteins, and some of these small proteins bind directly to the CRISPR-Cas machinery and completely neutralize the system. So this is what I'm going to tell you about today. <laughs> 
Before I do that, I just want to remind you that there's a lot of different CRISPR systems. They're incredibly diverse. This is a small subset of some of the CRISPR systems that we know about. But if you ask somebody on the street today, they oftentimes know what CRISPRs are, but they think it's synonymous with Cas9. And this has been captured in the limelight of the popular press and the scientific press because it's a single protein that can be programmed with a single guide RNA to target any sequence by design, as you heard about earlier. Um, and that, of course, is incredibly powerful. But it turns out that they're sort of obscure. So these enzymes represent about 10% of what you would really find in nature. And it's really these enzymes up here, the so-called class one, type one systems, that are both the most abundant and also the most diverse. And we study two of these different systems, the type one E system in E. coli and the type one F system in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it's this one F system from Pseudomonas that I'm gonna tell you about tonight. All right, so I'm gonna bring up uh, images of collaborators throughout. We, this has been um, really a collaborative effort. Um, and this is the system from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It consists of six cast genes flanked by two different CRISPR loci. Four of these cast genes make proteins that assemble with the RNA into this RNA-guided surveillance complex, 10 subunits, 350 kilodaltons. And all type 1 systems rely on a transacting nuclease called Cas3. This is the Cas3 nuclease in the system, which gets recruited to this complex when it finds an invading DNA. But what's unique about these type 1 F systems is that this Cas3 nuclease is fused to a Cas2 protein, and Cas2 and Cas1 assemble into an integration complex that's responsible for inserting foreign DNA into the CRISPR. So this system's a little bit odd in that this interference protein is infused to this adaptation protein, and the consequence of that is that it assembles into this heterohexameric complex that includes the integration complex, but this integration complex is fused to this critically important interference complex, this Cas3 nuclease. All right, so the other thing that I want to tell you about tonight is that these, so both of these complexes then are subject to antiviral or uh, anti-CRISPR suppression mechanisms. And this work has been done in collaboration with Alan Davidson and Joe Bondi Dinami. And together with them, we've been uh, involved in identifying these anti-CRISPR proteins that bind along the backbone of this complex or in the tail and suppress the ability of this machine to identify DNA. Or this Cas3 protein, or sorry, this uh, anti-CRISPR-3 protein, ACRF3 protein, that binds to the Cas3 and prevents recruitment here, so also suppressing the immune system. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more details about how those work. So this is the CSY complex, or the CRISPR RNA-guided surveillance complex. We determined the structure of this complex using cryo-electron microscopy. And when we built all the, um, the the models for all the Cas proteins, there was still this remaining density that had not been modeled yet. And of course, these are two molecules of these virally encoded anti-CRISPR protein, ACRF1. There's two molecules of that along the backbone. And another anti-CRISPR protein bound in the tail of this complex that represses DNA binding, but through a different mechanism. The backbone of this complex is made up of this repeating Cas7 subunit. It's a helical hexamer. Seven, uh, six, cas, uh, six subunits of Cas7. They all look like a right hand, fingers, palm, and thumb here. The palm is important for ordering the RNA into the pseudo A form configuration, and the thumb folds over the top of the RNA. And when it does that, it completely blocks one nucleobase, which does not participate in recognition of the invading virus. But the question is, how does this anti-CRISPR block DNA binding? And the answer is, is that here's one segment that has the complementary base pair. Then the DNA has to stretch over the top of this to the next segment of complementary DNA. But the anti-CRISPR settles right in that wedge between the fingers and the thumb and prevents access to the CRISPR RNA guide. So that's how this one along the backbone works. This other green subunit, or ACRF2, binds down here in the tail. And when we first determined the structure, we didn't know what the function of this feature right here was, but it looked like a DNA vise. And it turns out that this anti-CRISPR is a mimic of DNA. It takes on the same shape and charge of B-form DNA and wedges itself into this critical DNA binding feature down in the tail. And by doing so, it prevents the complex from recognizing double-stranded DNA.
All right, so that's also shown here biochemically. DNA travels fast through a gel, but when you add this big complex and the complex binds the DNA, it uh, retards the migration of the DNA through the gel. But if you add F1 or F2 to this complex, then the complex can't bind DNA. But there's another anti-CRISPR, F3, that when you add it to this complex, it doesn't inhibit the ability of this complex to bind DNA at all because it binds to the nuclease. So we had a couple questions after the, we determined the structure. How does the complex bind DNA and what are the structural consequences of that? And how does the complex recruit this transacting nuclease? So I'm going to show you a lot of work in one slide. We initially determined a structure of the surveillance complex bound to the two anti-CRISPRs. I just showed you that. A couple of months later, uh, Dinsha Patel and Shuram's lab published a structure of this complex without any anti-CRISPRs and bound to a partially duplexed piece of DNA. And this is an important structure because it shows some pretty radical conformational changes. This Helical backbone gets extended by 20 angstroms, creating this gap here, and the vise clamps down on this double-stranded DNA. And to be frank, we thought we might be scooped at this stage because we were working on a structure of this complex bound to DNA as well. But we were relieved to realize that our structure was different, and not just different in substrate. So we used a completely duplex piece of DNA, which is the biologically relevant substrate. But that structural difference that you can see here, you see this helical bundle undergoes a 180 degree rotation, exposing the opposite face of this helical bundle and locking up here towards the head. But the importance of that is that this face of this helical bundle turns out to be necessary to recruit the transacting helicate nuclease. So this R-loop formation, peeling apart the two strands of DNA, drives a conformational change that exposes the recruitment signal for this nuclease. But here's where it gets weird. The viruses, as Cedric was saying earlier, are sort of, um, well, these viruses in general, I suppose, are tinkers. And it appears that a virus stole this feature this helical bundle and repurposed it as an anti-CRISPR to bind to the nuclease and block recruitment by mimicking this helical recruitment signal. I'm going to show you how we think it works in this animation. The CSY complex makes non-sequence specific interactions with DNA until it finds a PAM. And when it binds a PAM, it clamps onto the DNA and peels the two strands apart, driving this conformational change that you see here. We're going to show that again. PAM recognition causes a closing of the vise and a conformational change that's uh, notable in the elongation of the backbone. We're zooming here in on the PAM sequence. There's specific amino acids that reach into the minor groove and make base-specific interactions with the PAM sequence itself. And that distortion then bends the DNA and facilitates RNA-guided strand invasion, where the complementary strand interacts with the guide RNA, and the display strand, where there's this wedge here that gets driven between them, is laid in this positively charged groove that gets formed as a consequence of the rotation of the helical bundle that I just showed you. And we think that this positively charged surface right here is necessary for stabilizing this display strand and slowing the back reaction, the real annealing of the two uh, double-stranded pieces of DNA. And to test that hypothesis, Mary Claire Rollins, or MC in my lab, made some mutations in this region by changing this positive charge to negative charge um, and showed that the wild type binds to DNA with high affinity, low nanomolar binding affinities, but the mutant has a severe binding defect that's characterized largely by a lower saturation of binding rather than a difference in KD. So we interpreted that, that this might be affecting the off-rate, accelerating the off-rate, because you're no longer able to stabilize this display strand. But if that were the reason for this binding defect, then she guessed that if she made a DNA substrate where there's no base pairing here, then there would be no base, base pairing back reaction, and so that the mutant would then not be defective, and that's shown here. Both the wild type and the mutant have the same binding isotherms when you use a bubble substrate. All right, so the other function of this, uh, the, the point of this 
DNA binding and exposing this recruitment helix is we had a structure of Cas3 bound to this anti-CRISPR. But the anti-CRISPR, I told you, is a mimic of this helical region of this helical bundle on the, the surveillance complex. If you superimpose the anti-CRISPR protein onto this feature of the surveillance complex, it superimposes with an RMSD of around four angstroms. Um, and this feature right here turns out to be critically important. We call this the recruitment helix. And the recruitment helix is buried when this complex isn't bound. And we think that that's functionally important because then it's not trying to recruit the nuclease to a surveillance complex that's not bound to a target. Instead, it takes RNA-guided unwinding of the DNA duplex to expose that recruitment helix and that recruits this Cas3 nuclease. All right, so that's just shown again here. We have a structure of the anti-CRISPR bound to the nuclease. This anti-CRISPR is a structural mimic of this feature on the surveillance complex that's only exposed after DNA binding. And amino acids on this face that are conserved between the anti-CRISPR and the helical bundle of the surveillance complex, when we mutate those, there's a severe defect for recruiting the nuclease for the mutant versus the wild type. And if you use this docking exercise to dock this, this uh, nuclease onto the surveillance complex, you can see that there's a remarkably good fit here. All right, so I'll just wrap up by uh, trying to give you the punchline from what I think I've learned over the last couple of years of studying CRISPRs and anti-CRISPRs, is that there's incredible diversity of CRISPRs, but this diversity is almost certainly mirrored by the diversity of anti-CRISPRs. And I think that this is the zone of conflict, and Joe Bondi Nanami had this, what I thought was a fairly pithy comment in a recent review, that there's 36 distinct families of anti-CRISPRs described in the literature that block seven different types of CRISPR-Cas systems so far. So in the last five years, there's been considerable progress in understanding the diversity and abundance of anti-CRISPRs. And I think that those anti-CRISPRs tell us precisely how the CRISPR systems work. They've benefited from a couple billion years to figure out molecular ways to short circuit these immune systems. So if you want to know how a CRISPR system works, then I advise you talk to a virus. All right, so I should uh, quickly thank some of the people who've done the work. Mary Claire Rollins in my lab has been primarily responsible for the, a lot of work I shared with you today. Joe Bondi Denami and his previous uh, advisor, Alan Davidson, have been longtime collaborators in the anti-CRISPR world. Gabe Lander and myself have been working together on CRISPR since we were postdocs, and his uh, former postdoc, Cy Cott, uh, recently moved to start his own lab um, at Stony Brook here just a little while ago. We've been fortunate to have funding from the NIH, and I'm really excited to announce that we were lucky enough to get one of these NSF MRI awards to purchase an electron microscope for the campus at MSU. So if you don't have time on your own microscope, maybe considering uh, a ski vacation. Um, and we've had some money for some, from some other funding agencies for some other genome engineering projects. With that, I'll take some questions. Maybe. Yeah, thank you. So do the anti-CRISPR proteins have many independent evolutionary origins? Can you discern that, or is it not clear because they're so small if you can relate them by homology? Do the anti-CRISPR proteins have different yeah. evolutionary origins? Like how many independent parallel origins do you discreetly see? Yeah, I'm probably not the right person to field that question, but I would say that there are multiple independent origins, and that's based on this idea that there's no sequence or structural similarity between a lot of the ones that we know. So that would be the basis of my answer. Um, the CRISPR systems themselves have evolved at least twice independently. So the class two and type one systems have almost certainly evolved independent of one another. But the DNA mimicry recurs, right, as a theme? DNA mimicry occurs uh, across recurs. many different systems. Systems. Yeah, but it goes well beyond CRISPR systems. DNA mimicry occurs in uh, even restriction enzymes. So there's inhibitors of restriction enzymes that viruses and plasmids make that look like bent DNA, and they bind perfectly to restriction enzymes and do the same thing. So DNA mimicry is something that we find all over every domain of life. With a lot of ways to do it, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question about the the model you showed of the 
of the um, the structure and how it um, proofread is that putting together your structure with another published structure or is that have you directly imaged the unrotated state mm. yeah that, do you like in other words are you, are you putting that together with a published structure or is it like you've directly imaged all of these states in different 3d classes yeah, um, yeah, I should have been more clear about that. So the movie that I showed yeah. of the surveillance complex landing on the duplex, sliding back and forth a little bit, and then finding the right spot, some of that was artistic liberty. Um, we, but, but it's supported by data. So we do, there is a recent paper that shows, we think that the process for finding a target is primarily through 3D diffusion. That's been shown experimentally, although there's a new paper that was just out that suggested that there's some short range 1D sliding that happens. So the image that I showed or the movie that I showed was intended to represent that to some level of accuracy. Uh, once it finds a PAM, we know that there's an ephemeral stall at the PAMs, but it's really short. And we don't know if the clamp clamps once it recognizes the PAM or it clamps when it's on the DNA and then stalls when it finds a PAM. We're not sure about some of those details. Um, but I think your bigger question was is about the morphing from one state to another. And this was morphing between uh, a couple of our structures and a couple of other people's structures from one conformational state to another without, you know, with all the restraints and not undergoing any major clashes and so on. All right, thank you.